Um, so this is a these workshops are part of a series, um, and we're collaborating, as um, we were just saying, between Plant, who's based in Tayport, the people learning about nature in Tayport, Nine Wells Community Garden over in Dundee, Yellow Wellies, who are based in Cooper. Um, hi, Andrea. And um, Strathcairn's Community Garden, and that's Bob, who's going to be leading our presentation today. Um, we're talking about soil testing and improving the soil. And if I can um, just remind you, if you've got any questions that you want to ask during the presentation, if you could just type them into the message box and I'll call on you at the end. If you put a wee asterisk before your message, I'm happy to read that out on your behalf if you don't want to speak up. Um, that just gives me a wee indicator um, who wants to speak and who, who wants to um, just have their message read out. Um, I'm going to hand over to Bob and he's going to tell us a lot about soil testing and improving soil. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, yeah, um, the last time we were actually in Strathkinnis, it was in April and uh, so it's about eight or nine weeks ago and we took you around the garden there. Uh, we've had a pretty difficult um, uh, little time since then because the, the, the really cold weather in May was a bit of a problem but um, I went into the garden this morning and harvested some some of our fruit and vegetables so I'll just have you a quick quick look at that I hope you can does that show up okay yeah okay so I just wanted to show a little bit of color first before we go into the soil because the soil tends to be a little bit on the dull side um, this is the soil for my allotment plot where um, most of this uh, uh, fruit and veg came from and um, just to say a little bit about soil before we get on to the messy stuff with the water and hopefully you brought some samples along with you um, we can we can consider soil to be um, a combination of uh, mineral particles organic matter which is uh, a lot of carbon and living organisms. Um, and the different soil types that we come across um, would range from at one extreme from clay, which, um, you know, if you've got that is a really quite a tricky soil to, um, to manage. I've had clay allotments in the past and I've been very, very um, hard to work in the early days. Um, at the other extreme, you can have uh, sandy soil, which um, um, some of our allotment plots in Strathkinners are that. Um, one thing about clay soil is um, the particles in clay are very, very tiny. And, um, um, and that's why it sticks together. So hopefully in the demonstration part, we'll be able to show some of that. Um, one good thing about clay soil is the fact that um, it's actually got a lot of um, um, nutrient in it. So if you can work it, and we'll, we'll talk about ways of working clay soil um, later on. On the other hand, uh, with organic materials, uh, at the other extreme, we've got sandy soil, which is very, very easy to work. You can make nice seed beds break it down, make seed drills, sow your seeds, but it also um, loses moisture really quickly. And again, organic materials can, can help that. I think in the chat room, um, I've forgotten who it was, but one of the ladies said who was in East Lothian uh, was having a lot of difficulty with very, very dry conditions. So hopefully we'll be able to talk about that in, in more detail. Um, just a couple of facts about soil, which um, I find quite interesting. Um, um, soil actually locks a lot of carbon into its structure. In fact, there's twice as, over twice as much carbon in soil as there is in all the plant vegetation in the world, including all the trees and carbon in the form of CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's really, really important um, to know about um, the carbon from the or organic matter in the soil. 
I think the other interesting fact is that for me is that um, in the UK we do very very little to analyze and monitor our soil we spend over 200 times more on monitoring air purity and water purity than we do in in testing soil um, that's starting to improve a little bit and certainly in Scotland we're very very um, fortunate near Dundee to have the James Hutton Institute and they're doing the soil scientists there are doing a lot of work to characterize soils and um, and, and and find out ways of um, of growing crops in a better way um, in fact if you go if you if you really want to look into this a little bit more you can there's an app that um, James Hutton Institute have you can put your postcode into it and actually um, they will um, give you tell you exactly what your soil is in in your location to that postcode so that that's that's uh, kind of interesting as well um, so we talked about the different extremes of soil there's a sandy soil clay soil in between there is um what's termed a silty soil which is sort of quite small particles not quite as small as clay and then if you're really really lucky you've got a loam soil which has got um organic matter in and it grows really well um hopefully you can see that this really black soil is um soil which can you lift it up slightly but bob can you just lift it slightly higher you got it yeah okay now the soil has gone everywhere but never mind um <laughs> that soil comes out of my i've got a um in strathkinney's i've got a tiny little garden cottage garden actually my wife does most of the gardening now i'm banned from it but um that soil is the cottage the, the garden is 200 years old and that soil is um it's been worked all over those years and it, it's nearly black from just looking after it <laughs> over those years um so it's quite a light sandy soil there um we've got we'll have a chance to sort of um talk more about soil i think it might be a good time to go and look at different so soil samples particularly that helena and um andrea have um could we maybe go out start that now yep. helena yep sure i've got i'm gonna just to this down i've got this soil here which i'm trying, trying to show you uh, but this is quite clay clay soil which come from nine wells community garden and this bed in particular can you see that this bed in particular was very waterlogged all winter um, and i've got another one which came from just a rough soil it was, it was soil that was piled up i think after um house building uh, maybe a few tens of years ago but um it's been weed killer it's not particularly been treated in any way that would be beneficial to the soil and i'm going to andrea are you going to talk through the how you can test it for the amount of clay and i'll do the yeah. actual demonstration okay so i've got can i show you my sample oh yeah can you hear me uh, yeah can i just uh, point out that if um Andrea's talking, you're not going to be recorded, Helena, so you can't show and talk at the same time okay. with, uh, with that rolling test. Um, okay. I will. Do you just want to do your rolling test? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. So, um, so this is, this is that um, soil from Nine Wells from the very waterlogged bed. I've, I've just dug a little bit of it up. And I've added a tiny bit of water. I'm just going to get some that hasn't got too many stones in it. Now, I tried this a minute ago and it got completely mucky, which is why I've got my gloves on. <laughs> and you can see that it is, it's forming, it's forming a little bit of a sausage. I think I need a little bit more water, but I'm managing to roll it. 
See that? And it is cracking a little bit, but the fact that it's holding together, I think gives an indicator that there is a fair bit of soil in it, a uh, clay in it. So you can try that yourself. And I'm going to compare that with the other one, which I know is just quite stony, not very anything soil. That one's, that one's not, I'm not managing to get much of a, a sausage on that one at all. That one's not got as much clay in it. So if, if you want to get all mucky and test your own soil, then there's, oh, it's, it's holding together a bit, so there might be some in it. You just have to add a little bit of water to your soil. Well, that one's rolling quite nicely. Maybe that's got more clay in it than I was, I was thinking it does. So that's what you do is you add some water, you oops, roll it, and the more clay it has, the more likely it will hold together. So, and the thinner you can get before it breaks is an indicator of how much um, how much clay you've got in there. Um, can I just say we will link uh, in the, in the notes from this. Uh, we will link to videos and and step by step instructions on how to do this rolling test. Um, so um, hopefully that will help. And of course, um, if you have bare hands, it's it's makes it easier to roll things as well. Yeah, I was doing that just because I knew I'd have to be typing. <laughs> Cleverly put some gloves on. <laughs> I've already, I've still got soil all over the, uh, all over everywhere though. <laughs> Might be best to do that one outdoors. I'll, I'll hand over to you, Andrea. Okay, so mine is in a jar, nice and clean. <laughs> um, so this is a really easy one to do. Um, you just get a jar, take it outside. I don't know how well you can see that. I'll put a white sheet on the back. Um, Okay, so you fill up your jar. Um, you should really give it about 24 hours to settle, but you'll see the difference between the sand, the silt, and the clay. Um, because it's hard to see, I just drew up a picture. And you can actually see the particle size. So the sand, if that's one uh, millimeter, your, your silt is just teeny tiny, and your clay is barely visible. So. If you just imagine your tiny particles in a jar, you can understand that um, clay being so small um, would not let a lot of water pass through. Um, sand, on the other hand, because they're big balls sitting next to each other, you get more space and um, therefore the sand, the water will pass through really uh, quickly. So this is a really easy thing to do. You just have to wait um, 24, 24 hours. So just get a bit of water. Um, and then the sample that you take, you just want to dig down a little bit into your soil. So I guess you go, go down about six inches or so and then grab kind of a scoop um, from your plot of that and then just put it in. And then you'll see your ideal proportions would be 40% sand, the bottom, 40% um, uh, silt, and then about 20% clay. So mine, I know I, I know because I did this last time, it's probably about 70% sand, um, a tiny, tiny bit of clay, and then a little bit of grit, or sorry, a little bit of silt on top. So I'm out there all the time um, adding more and more water to our plot. It's quite in, uh, intense work because it's been so dry, but um, at least at least we, we know what we're dealing with and that I can go out and do that. Um, it's much cleaner, so you can do it inside. <laughs> and that's it. So uh, back to you, Bob. I think that's covered just how to, how to do that. And you're you on mute, Bob. You're muted again. Yep. Thank you. That's better. Um, my, mine's one I, I did yesterday, and um, it's similar to Andrea's fair. Um, it's uh, it's from my allotment plot. It's very very similar. There's the silt layer. There's the sand, the silt, the clay. There's a lot of organic stuff on the top as well from compost, which is sort of um, in the top surface of the soil. 
uh, you can see that. Uh, that's in quite contrast to the, for my garden, what I said earlier, that black 200 years old soil, it, it's basically just one layer at the bottom and then everything else is clear. It's, it's just probably just sand and maybe a bit of silt, but mainly sand. And uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a cottage garden, which is mainly used for growing flowers in. So quite different to the allotment plot. Okay, is that, uh, is that the samples um, for now? Okay, that's good. Um, I think one, it's worth talking now about testing soils. Um, you, you can, there's a number of organizations where you can send samples to and get the pH tested. You can get your um, um, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, potassium tested if you want to. But um, uh, yeah, you can, or you can buy a soil testing kit and do some of this. But you can, you can actually find quite a lot out from your soil just by looking at the plants and the weeds that grow in it. So I think um, we can show you a little bit about that now. We'll show you, um, I'll show you a couple of things that um, um, would grow. So here's the nice rhododendron. And um, if you can grow rhododendrons in your garden, then your soil is acid, it's got some acidity. It, it, does, it doesn't indicate that it's uh, really, you know, very, very acid. You can grow rhododendrons as long as it's less than a pH of seven. It can be just sort of 6.5, 6.7, and you'll grow rhododendrons. But not everywhere in this part of Fife can grow rhododendrons. For instance, at the Botanic Gardens, they had to add in the 1960s had to make big peat beds in order to grow rhododendrons. Um, if you go to Cambo Garden along the coast, they can't grow rhododendrons there. The soil is, is, is too alkaline. Um, so that is one plant indicator. I've got a couple more. Um, in the bottom of our orchard in Strathkinnis, um it grew, the the soil is pretty it's pretty consolidated it doesn't drain very well and it grows buttercups so buttercup is a good it's a, a good indicator of um of really damp conditions wet conditions poor drainage and if you've got that really you you you, you need to improve your soil um, by adding a lot of organic material to it. Um, the other thing we found about um, that part of the orchard, it doesn't grow plums very well. It grows apples okay, but um, that type of very claggy soil is not very good for growing stone fruit like plums, cherries. Um, by contrast, at the top of the orchard, we, we grow this... Uh, this material, this corn spurry, it grows everywhere. It's an annual weed and it loves sandy soil, light sandy soil. And that is, a, again, a good indicator of, um, a, of a, a sandy type uh, soil there. Um, okay, I think uh, if you have hydrangeas in your garden, and it's a bit early for hydrangeas now, they can, in, the color of the hydrangea can indicate the um, acidity of your soil. It's a little bit opposite to the litmus test in that if you grow them, uh, if the pinky red hydrangeas would indicate uh, more alkaline soil, whereas the, the red, pinky red ones, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> the, pink, the pinky red ones would indicate the alkaline soil. The, the blue ones would indicate the acid soil. It's opposite to sort of a litmus test on a, on testing soils. Okay. Um, maybe we can, we could go on now and uh, talk about ways of, of improving your soil so that, um, so, so that you can grow good vegetables and fruit. 
Um, we've talked a lot in, over these sessions on composting and um, we've had uh, various sessions on there and compost is the obvious, homemade compost is the obvious way of, um, of improving your soil. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think a couple of weeks ago, Peter Christopher gave a talk on composting and he talked about um, um, adding different layers to a compost heap and he talked about carbon to nitrogen ratios, getting into about 12 parts of carbon to one of nitrogen. Um, the other way of, um, of doing this is using a mulch and um, there are various mulches you can use um, in in Dundee for instance you can you can use their municipal mulch as a layer on the bed this is uh, this is a really useful way of um, adding organic materials to your to your plot and letting the worms sort of drag it in um, you don't have to dig it in. A lot of people are, are, are now moving to more no dig methods of gardening or even just very, very um, localized sort of scratching in of, of your compost into the surface of it. And this can have a lot of advantages as, uh, as well compared to deep digging. I think when I first had an allotment, um, people used to do things like double digging and um, they'd big out big trenches and turn the soil over. Well, I, I don't think we, 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 we do, it, apart from being hard work, it, it, it's not such a good way of treating your soil. It, you, you, you're better really just to use a, um, either a no dig technique or, or, or work just for the very, very surface of it. Um, so different mulches you can use. You can use some, um, you can put some leaf mold on um, you can put a thin layer of grass clippings on. Grass clippings are actually quite high in nitrogen, so you can actually lay them on, and and it and they won't rob your soil of um, of of the nitrogen into it. Um, Comf is a really good material to mulch onto the surface of your plot. Um, you can also use um, comfrey with. Um, a layer of grass clippings over the top which stops the comfrey from drying out too much. Now the com comfrey is a really useful um, addition to the garden because it's got, uh, it, its roots go down about six feet and it mines up minerals in the form of, um, of um, phosphorus and potassium and um, it brings them up to the surface, puts them into the leaves and you can actually use the comfrey straight away onto your on, onto your garden. You can dig it in if you want. If you're doing early potatoes, well, if you're doing potatoes, you can actually and you you actually put them into a trench. You can actually put the comfrey in with it, um, or you can, as we've actually mentioned in the past, you can make comfrey liquor. Um, we had a in, in the April session, we, we, we showed you how to make uh, a non-smelly comfy food by taking the comfy leaves and put them into a, a bucket. And we've got a reference um, to that session without going into the details now on it. So you can make uh, a comfy liquor and you can use that for certainly for um, feeding your tomatoes because it's got a lot of potash in it. Um, leaf mold is a really useful material if you've got if you've got leaves that um, you can drag out in the autumn um, if you've got a lot of them you can make a separate um, leaf mold bin um, leaf leaf mold works a little bit differently to compost in that um, it's aerobic so you need to actually get some um, oxygen into it for it for the um, for the fungi to 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 to, to work. Um, it might take a year or two, but you'll get a lovely um, mulching material from that. Um, if you're lucky enough to be able to 
be able to get out is some pine needles that makes a nice acid mulch um, but you can also use for making comp um, certain compost with um, it's also good for fruit like blueberries that need acid conditions and the pine needles will make an acid acid um, mulch um, farmyard manure that's another material that um, you can um, sort of cultivate into the top surface of your soil or dig in if you do dig in um, you can lay it on as a mulch um, you have to be a little bit careful with the source of your uh, manures because there are have been examples even this year of people taking in manure that has got contaminated with um, hormone uh, weed colours through the um, manuring process and uh, have to be a little bit careful there. I think I mentioned grass clip clippings earlier as well so if you're taking gr grass cuttings from your neighbours to use the mulch make sure they haven't been sprayed with um, with a hormone weed killer because that will um, it, it would be particularly bad for your things like potatoes, tomatoes and beans. It makes them all curl up. It's really, really quite, uh, quite bad from that point of view. Um, another really useful um, material is a, is a green manure. So it, it's very, very important to keep your soils healthy by not having a lot of bare soil showing so early in the season or later on in the season you can sow you can sow a green manure um, some of these materials are nitrogen fixing so that's quite useful there's things like clover um, mustard field beans um, grazing rye um, you can also after you say harvested your potatoes um, you've got bare soil there and if you haven't got a another crop to follow it I sometimes put some late leeks in after my potatoes but you can sow a layer of, um, of um, green manure but um, some of them withstand the winter and then you can just um, let them drag into your soil in the early spring so really important to actually keep your plot um, fully clothed with plants, be, be them vegetables, fruit, or, 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 manure, or these green manure crops. I think the other way of, um, of doing that is to actually grow some catch crops in between your, 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 your crops. For instance, you've got a, I've got rows of um, brassicas, cabbages, broccoli planted at the moment, and I've sowed rows of lettuce and radish and stuff in between. So it all covers up the soil, which is, um, which is a really good, good thing to do. Bob, um, Bob we yeah. might need to do some questions soon because we're getting to 20 yeah, minutes sure. to go. I, I, think, I think that's probably, um, that probably is a good point to actually go to questions and, and um, take it from there. Yeah, great. Okay, excellent. Right, so um, I'm going to look at the questions and do them in order. If you hadn't brought soil along, it's okay, you can still do the tests later. Um, there's a, a few people asking about the H James Hutton app. Um, oh, the, the app from Hutton? Yes. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a really useful one. I'm, I'm just trying to... If I look on my phone, I'll actually if, be able to tell you what would, it's called. Would it turn Would it turn up if they just searched for James Hutton Soil App? Yes. Um, okay. It's. Uh, I just can't remember the name of it at the moment. But again, uh, we I'm we just, can post post it, uh, Bob. Don't worry wait, about sorry. it just now. If yeah, you can't yeah. find it, we'll post it in the summary on the blog um, in the next few days. So okay. look up all okay. the relevant stuff. Okay, there was a question about the water, but Andrea's answered that. Okay, I asked this one. So it was about your um, plum trees and the not doing well where the buttercups yeah. survive. Is that because they need better drainage 
uh, the stone fruits need better drainage through the winter? Um, I think it probably is. Yeah, I think I think I think the uh, the bottom of the orchard gets a little bit got a little bit waterlogged when we had a wet spell, and there was standing water. And and although the apple trees survived it, the plums don't seem to like it. Okay. And um, we've lost. We only had a small number anyhow, about five, but we lost three of them in the first uh, three years of the orchard. Okay. And I, I think it's, um, you're better to plant plum trees on the freer draining um, land, definitely. Right. Excellent. Right, Rob, you've mentioned what weeds you've got growing. Do you want to... Oh, you're muted. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, it was just like a cocktail of weeds that I've got and whether it meant anything. I mean, I've got a massive amount of borage. It grows everywhere. It grows, grows. Oh, well. the borage, yeah. It's great. Like, I use it for feeds and other things as well. Uh, mare's tail, lots of that. Dandelions, nettles, and the creeping buttercup, although I think that soil's quite good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what, 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 what's your question? What, what are you trying to... Well, you were talking about you were talking about a cocktail of weeds and what that meant in terms of your soil. So I just wondered what my cocktail meant. Oh, okay. Well, the the, the borage is something we get in the village everywhere. Um, someone we we do the well, like you were mentioning in the chat room earlier, we do the um, um, five in bloom thing, and we've got some bed one bed in the village which um, someone planted one borage plant in it is just everywhere mm. and uh, it, <laughs> I think it, it it's probably is an indicator of um, in that area quite quite um, quite well drained fine soil yes. um, it, it's actually turned up we, we've got a, um, a cornfield annual um, uh, flower meadow in our village as well quite a large one in the play park and and the borage is even come into that one as well could, could so I, I quick, it, it just seeds everywhere doesn't it could, could i do a quick supplementary then because the other question i was asking was about borage as well and uh, yeah basically i use it as an alternative to comfrey because it's a it's really yeah the plant. definitely yeah and i make a plant feed with it I use it as a mulch uh, i put it on salads i use it for lots of things but yeah Am I right? I mean, am I not kidding myself by thinking it is a good alternative to comfrey? I don't have comfrey well, for borage. It, it, it's certainly not as deep rooted as um, as comfrey. And as I, as I was saying earlier, the roots of comfrey go right down, and they actually mine into the subsoil and bring uh, nutrients up to the top. So, uh, um, from that point of view. Um, from what I remember, I mean, would 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 you agree that borage is maybe not that deep rooted? It's no. it, it, it it's, it's, it's fairly out. shallow rooted, isn't it? Yeah, it's easy to pull but, it out. But uh, but it, it's got a lot of um, it, it, it's it's worth trying as a, 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 a as a, an alternative to comfrey for that reason. I have been doing it for three four years, and it seems it seems yeah. to work. Yeah. One, th one thing I would say about borage is that the seeds are dispersed by ants. They have a little fatty deposit on the end of the seed and uh, the ants take them down into their nests. So it might be more of an indicator of drier soils if ants can be living in the soil um, around there and they're taking the, the, the seeds down. So they feed on the, on the, the fatty deposit and then leave the, the rest of the seed to grow. So, I've seen no sign of ants in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll also it'll also spread if it just lands. But I mean, if it's if it's travelling, it might be that I've I've seen ants carrying carrying them along. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And the next question was Marika about pH. If you'd like to unmute. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi. I was wondering, is there kind of an average pH that you would go for that would kind of do a wide range of vegetables? Or would you really kind of aim to have particular pHs for a particular kind of vegetable bed? 
Yeah, I, 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 I'd say, um, I mean, some, some crops like brassicas do like it uh, a little bit more on the alkaline side. And so you can add um, some ground limestone in, yeah. in the, well, in the winter or early, or, or early spring, mm -hmm. just to, to bring the pH um, a little bit higher. If you've got acid soil, put some limestone out for, for those particular crops. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think I, certainly the, the, the pH I've measured in, in our community garden in different plots is, is only slightly on the acid side and it seems to grow most, most things okay. Mm -hmm. But I do add a little bit of uh, ground limestone for the um, brassicas and maybe a little sprinkling for peas and beans as well. Right, so you try, you do try to kind of adjust your beds in pH a little bit according to the vegetable you've got planting on. Just a little bit, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. And um, another question from Rob, which was kind of answered by Susanna, but I'm going to open it up, which um, mm. Rod was asking, where do you get the municipal mulch in Dundee? And oh, right. I don't know if the Riverside Drive Recycling Centre is open again or not. I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that. Yes, it is open, but it's, it's very um, strict. It's all about... Um, uh, queuing up uh, just one person throwing their stuff into the in, into the tips it's like they're not they're not set up for all the kind of other extra things that the recycling center does and also i can tell you there's usually an absolutely huge queue of cars trailing trailing back because they're only obviously letting a few cars in so don't hold your breath for it for the moment i would say just okay. let it you know better wait a bit longer <laughs> Stick with your comfrey and borage mulches. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, one thing, just mentioning the comfrey again, I was wondering, do you chop your comfrey up when you put it as a mulch or do you just add it as large leaves? I I, I don't chop it up at all, no. I just sort of uh, grab the leaves and just, um, just spread them around. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and Marika, you've got another question about seaweed? So your question about yeah about, about seaweed uh, oh yeah how how about just going to the beach and kind of collecting lots of seaweed and mulching that for your soil what, what would you say about that yeah um okay we, we've talked about this in the past and i think um i think as long as you harvest the seaweed from the sort of high tide line which is um loose yeah. um that's okay um H helena you you commented on this in the past haven't you yeah, uh, i certainly you, i i certainly get seaweed from the east sands occasionally um i put it on the compost heap and i use it as a mulch okay and is there any and particular type of seaweed you would go for is there any particular type you would i go i just go for whatever's ha around whatever's at the time happened. yeah likewise yeah <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah, it's got a lot of lot of trace elements in it. It's, it, it. it's good stuff, and and of course that's how in the islands they the, the lazy beds how they built them up in the past. They just piled seaweed on and grew the tatties through them. Okay. Um, that would be a real no dig method of growing potatoes. Yeah. And would you, would you would you wash it first when you when you get it home? Well, I, I don't, but yeah, some people may maybe would do that, but I, I never bother. <laughs> you don't bother. Okay. No. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Melissa about onions. Oh yes. Can you find your mute? <laughs> yeah, I found it. I found it. I forgot about ask now. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, I've got potatoes in my garden just now, and you were saying about you could maybe put leeks in afterwards. Is there are types of onions you could put in, maybe that would last over winter, and you'd harvest them in the spring. Oh, to grow onions over the winter and harvest them in the spring. Oh, okay. Um, I 
I, I haven't done that for a long time, but we I used to grow onions called Japanese onions that used to overwinter. Really? And, and they worked out really well. And uh -huh. you got a, a really early crop. Um, but I haven't done that recently. I don't know what any if anyone any any from anyone else has, but uh, but certainly the garlic we 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 grow we plant in November mm -hmm. in a community garden, and that overwinters and grows well. Um, I I don't I don't see why you shouldn't um, shouldn't do overwintering of onions, particularly. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, where, where 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 are you? Where do you grow? Where? Um, Lanark, so oh sort of yeah, in between just, Glasgow and Edinburgh. You get you get pretty mild winters, don't you? Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I I think I think I think you could you could overwinter onions there no, without any problem. Mhm. Mm Great, thank you. Is, okay. I don't know, and Andrea, do yeah. Andrea do do we do onions in the yeah, we, all over winter. we get um, onion sets and we plant them in the autumn. Mm. Um, I yeah. forget what type they are, but the Japanese one sounds familiar, and I think there's a red type as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we do put them in, yeah, kind of September, October, maybe. At the mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. they don't always. They're not. They don't always turn out to be really good, depending on your winter. So, so, mm -hmm. so like you, Bob, I've kind of given up on that and just waited till the spring. Um, but th but then you've got a bare soil, so yeah. I think yeah. Why not? If you've got bare soil, putting mulch on is a really good plan. If you can get your seaweed down instead of, of if you haven't had a chance to get the um, green manure down, if you can get seaweed on because it stops mm. um, it just stops the rain hitting the ground and washing away your nutrients quite so much. Mm -hmm. Great, so, thank you. We're nearly Actually, running out of time. I think we've only got time for one more question, but we've got about three more questions to be asked. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, Katinka, you're next in line um, about pine needle mulches. So, I was just wondering if uh, the pine needle, it can be any type of pine, or is there a better one, like Scott's pine? And also, if you just harvest the pine needles and put them fresh on the soil as a mulch, or do you dry them before or put them on the compost heap? Um, so, sorry, I didn't, I didn't pick that up on my phone very well. What do you do to your well. pine needles? What do you do to your pine needles? You compost them, do you? Oh, the pine needles. Yeah, um, this is something that the gardeners in the Botanic Gardens do a lot. and. Um, I work as a volunteer there and one of our jobs is to actually collect great piles of pine needles and um, they actually compost them separately from the other leaves and materials in a big pile and they leave them for two years which is quite a long while um, and, and that makes a really fantastic acid mulch that they use for their acid loving plants in the botanic garden so yeah, if you can get hold of pine needles, that's great. And if you can mulch them around your blueberries, that's absolutely a brilliant way of bringing your blueberries on. And is there a good type of pine that's better or just any kind of pine needles? So, um, I, that's, that's really echoey. <laughs> is there any specific kinds of pine needles or just any pine needles? Oh, any any anything from a conifer tree, um, any conifer tree, the pine needles, um, just mix them all together. You know, Scots pine, any of the other pines, just just, just any of them, if you know where, if you know if you know of any. Um, is is that oh, Helen? Is that okay if in woods to take pine needles? Do you think? Um. Again, in a wood, yeah. If, if it's a private wood, well, you wouldn't go in a private wood, maybe. No. But um, I, I would say if you, mm, I don't know the answer to that actually. No, I'm not sure. Um, if, it's in your, if you've got a friend who's got a big pine tree, you might. I'm sure they would be delighted if you took some pine needles away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. Okay. Um, Thank you. Right. So we are nearly out of time. So, um, if anyone wants to stay, I think we can um, 
spend a, I, I'm okay to wait for a bit longer. I think, Bob, are you okay to wait another five minutes? Yes, yeah, fine. Finishing, asking the questions? Yeah. Um, sure. Okay, so finding where we were. So someone, Sandy, are you still in the room? Yeah, would you like to ask your question about acidic soil? You're muted. I'll unmute. Um, yeah, I, I I don't have a problem with pine needles because I live I live right um, on land that used to be all pine forests anyway. Oh. So my soil is really hugely acidic. So I should grow blueberries. Um, oh right. <laughs> in terms of everything else, what's the best thing? Um, I I've been putting wood ash on my soil to try and bring the the pH up a bit. But I wondered if, yeah. if that was enough, or whether I should be adding limestone as well. I, I, I don't think the wood ash would be maybe quite enough. Um, and I, I think it's worth adding the ground limestone rather than the, the, um, the other sort of uh, li lime, some type of powdery stuff they sometimes mm -hmm. grow. Better use ground limestone or, I'm, I'm not sure how easy it is to get a hold of, but you've got dolomitic, dolomitic limestone which has got magnesium in okay, which would yeah. be very very good if you can get hold of it yeah but uh, but 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 ground limestone would be very good but add your wood ash as well definitely okay. um i've i've got a wood burner and I, I i put my wood ash onto into my my little compost i've got one of those little dalek bins in my small garden and i put it in there but um equally um you can put it um on your soil yeah um, as a mulch. Been mixing layering because i've got a wood burner as well i've been layering my wood ash in with my compost you know yeah. kitchen so things. yeah that's quite interesting that's quite unusual to have a garden maybe um where a lot of conifers were grown previously and do, do you manage to um how, how do you get on do you, do you grow some some things okay yeah i mean it's quite poor soil so and, I, and I've, yeah. I've only been like doing it a couple of years so i'm learning what grows and what doesn't grow and also we're very high up so we've, we've got a very short season as well so but yeah. last year i had good success with brassicas strangely um, um good. peas didn't do so well last year but they seem to be growing okay this year um and um root vegetables seem to do okay so yeah it's 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 um it seems to be working so and, and can, can you get uh, have you got access to sort of compost and things garden um, compost no well i'm trying to make some but um yeah um i don't think i've got my compost heat right yet so i need to work right. on that but um and also i'm trying to avoid animal products so things like manure and you know yeah blood and yeah and all it's that. definitely worth okay. also those animal manures they'll be a bit on the acidic side as well yeah so avo avoid those but it, okay. if maybe if you go back to to uh the one we had from tayport garden with peter christopher or just on composting yeah that was an excellent one you can go back onto the website here and and you can yeah, I, listen I, to that recording if yeah, you if you I, weren't actually there at present at the time no i managed to join that one so i've got lots of things to work on <laughs> oh right yeah that's <laughs> good my compost keep working yeah excellent yeah okay, okay that's fine right, well good sandy. luck that's you you've got a toughie there thank you <laughs> <laughs> sandy yours is the, the next question about comfrey being invasive Hmm. Yeah, I have I've planted comfrey seedlings. At the moment, I've got them in pots. But one of my friends, yeah. who's an ecologist, said, "Don't plant it. It's really invasive. Don't yeah. let it go wild." So, and yeah. then, and I think um, I'd thought about pots, but planting it in pots. But you, you were saying the benefit of it is that the, you know you've got hugely deep tap yeah. roots. So if you're planting in pots, that kind of defeats the object, doesn't it? So is there another? Yeah, it does. It does. What 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 I'd recommend you do is some um, buy in some Bokin fourteen comfrey. Okay. From Garden and Organic in Wrighton in Coventry. Yep. And what they do, they send you little offsets of it. Okay. It, it's it's not too expensive. 
And um, the good thing about that is um, it is sterile and it doesn't set seed. Uh, Whereas okay. these seedlings that you've got, they'll seed everywhere. And that's why you've been told it's a bit invasive because it actually propagates by from seeds. Whereas the the Russian comfrey, Russian comfrey Bokin 14, that um, that is sterile. And, oh, okay. and I've got five plants I've had in for eight years now and it's not spread at all. And and then what you can do is um, you can take your, once it's established after a couple of years, you can actually split your plants and give it to your friends. Okay. And then they won't have to buy any. Okay. Oh, that's really useful to know. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, can you, can you give the details for where the comfrey is from for the, for the um, information that we send out at the end? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but just, it's just go, if you write yeah, it, if you write it, sorry, I was going to say you can just we can get it written out, out and send out sent out to everyone that was. Oh, on okay, the call. yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, the next question was Melissa about fleecing as an option instead of covering. Melissa, you still here? Um, yeah. So as an option of covering. I don't think I, I think somebody replied that to me. Um, I don't think I asked oh. that. I don't know where it's, I can't find it anymore. <laughs> it was, it was, if, if I can't plant for cover over winter, would you cover the soil with fleece? Cover the soil with fleece. Mm. Um, <sighs> yeah, I, 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 I think so. I mean, what, one, one thing we didn't really go into was the fact that, um, um, these organic materials, apart from putting nutrients into your soil for growing, um, they also can lock carbon into your soil. And um, um, some of this carbon can actually be burnt off from oxygen in the air. So any sort of covering will, will prevent that. Um, I, I think you could do that. It, it is better to use a plant material, either a mulch or a, a green manure, but I, I, I would thought um, it would be okay for any sort of covering, uh, a fleece covering, and it, it would warm your soil a little bit in the early spring as well. It wouldn't, didn't look all that wonderful, but there you go. Okay, that's great, and I think... The, yep, yeah, that's the end. We've we've reached the end of all the questions, and we'll send out the links for the details to get the comfrey, um, with the email that goes out at the end of the session. Thank you so okay. much. Has everyone filled their evaluation uh, forms out? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Um, yeah, do, should we do a big wave? Yes. So, yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Bye-bye.